So welcome to uh, our flip lecture three. Today we are going to talk about fraction methods. So the program of today flip lecture is first we will introduce the concept of this Ewell sphere, and then we will see a number of applications uh, like uh, single crystal diffraction with uh, monochromatic beam. Uh, single crystal diffraction with a white beam, and finally powder diffraction. So the airwell construction is then on reciprocal space, so you need first to have a reciprocal lattice as is shown in A at left. Uh, so between any two dots of this uh, lattice, we have a vector of the reciprocal lattice, and as you know, the diffraction condition in the lower version mean, tell us that this GHK vector, because we are in two dimensions, we have only two Miller index, H and K, K. So the GHK vector should be equal to the uh, K vector, which is the um, scattering vector, the difference between the K0 and K1. So. If now we look in B, uh, in the airwall construction, what we are going to do is just to make a circle. In general, in three dimensions, will be a sphere, which is called the Ewell sphere. And this sphere or circle here has uh, as a radius the wave vector uh, that can be K0, K1, as you know, in uh, the diffraction scattering that is. Um, conserves energy, K1 and K0 modules are equal. So, if uh, uh, now you imagine that uh, the difference between two this, these two vectors, K1 and K0, that is K here in green, equals one vector GHK, we are in the diffraction condition. So to verify when this is going to happen, what we're going to do is to take one point in the perimeter of the circle that we call O and we are going to fix it on the origin of the reciprocal lattice the origin that can be any point of the reciprocal lattice so this is shown in the next slide but let me first uh, just insist that the, the way to place the equal sphere on the reciprocal lattice is by putting the one point of the perimeter on a point of the reciprocal lattice and not the center of the circle. That is a mistake that sometimes I see. So here it is, the uh, Ewell sphere on the reciprocal lattice. And as you see, uh, we are in a, in a situation in which the O point in the perimeter is of course touching the lattice because this is by definition and but we find that there is another point of the reciprocal lattice that is also touching the lattice so this means that between these two points we have a vector ghk of the uh, reciprocal lattice and this vector is going to be equal to the vector k as we show here so that means that we will have the fraction under the two theta angle. To show more, more clearly, I take again a number one, the image that ju just we have seen, and then you can imagine that what you have, if I by translating parallelly the vectors, that we have the vectors k0, as you see in image number two at the right. So the k0, that is the incident beam that is arriving to the crystal, and is going to be diffracted in the direction K1. So we identify clearly the uh, family of planes that is going to diffract with an angle uh, 2 theta between K0 and K1 with a diffraction condition theta, and this is shown in 3. And as you see, these planes are perpendicular to the vector K. Let's then apply now this uh, well construction to the case of uh, diffraction with a monochromatic beam. 
So here we have the equal construction with the, uh, the point after right that is set just uh, as the origin and coincidence with the perimeter of the equal sphere. This is an HK0 layer in a three-dimensional system, three-dimensional lattice. So on, in the AWOL construction, what we do is that we fix this point at the right, and we are going to rotate around this axis that is perpendicular to the screen. So we start to rotate like here, and you see that uh, at a given point, we can have one, two, point, two other points which match uh, the circular perimeter. And then for each one of these cases, we will find it in the lower condition. So we will have diffracted beam following these two other points with a bit more. And we find two other points which also match the diffraction condition. And then we have diffracted beams in such directions. Again, we turn a little bit more. And this time there is only one point for which the lower condition is matched. And then we have here almost backscattering and refracted beam. So if you imagine now a three-dimensional crystal, first of all, we have again here drawn at the top left, the K0, the incident uh, beam, arriving to the the HK0 plane that we have seen, and we have seen that we can have different diffraction directions that are shown here by the lines. But then you can imagine now uh, that you have an HK1 plane, and then with this same incident beam, some points are going to touch the, the sphere when we are going to rotate around uh, our point uh, at our origin that is fixed in the perimeter of the sphere and we will have diffracted beams in these different directions and the same thing for the HK minus one plane so this defines co cones in which we will find spot of diffraction so now well, you can imagine that you can place that is shown here uh, a detector that can be a uh, um, for instance in the case of x-rays an X-ray sensitive film around this uh, crystal that is placed uh, in the center. Of course, we are representing here the crystal by its reciprocal lattice, and we will detect the different spot. And this is what is called the Weissenberg method. And so you have as shown a film wrapped to cylindrically around the crystal, and the X-ray is arriving by an aperture in this film. And then, uh, when you open the film, that is the image shown uh, below, when you open the film to flatten it, you will find the different points corresponding to the two cones of the fraction and the central line for the HK0 plane. And the, uh, the incident beam uh, is uh, scattering in, at the center, so this is why we have uh, a, a dark zone at the center. So you can see at the right uh, a sketch uh, and an image of this type of Weissenberg uh, camera, which are nowadays not much used. This is a modern single crystal diffraction setup. It's a four circle diffractometer. And you see here the X-rays arriving from the left, violet and arriving to the crystal that is in top of a goniometer head. That this can be, uh, it, this head uh, has a number of settings to allow to put exactly the crystal on the center of uh, rotation of the different circles. And you can here see theta, chi, omega circles, uh, which allow to orient the crystal and the detector. So it's a, sorry, it's a th three th circle diffractometer and you see that here we have uh, at the just at the right a two-dimensional area detector that this allows to uh, to uh, uh, collect a high number of uh, photons coming from different directions you see also a nitrogen stream 
tube coming from the top that this allows to cool the crystal as we will see this can be interesting for some applications so now let's turn to uh, another method of uh, diffraction that is the lower method in this case we are going to use a white beam a white beam means a non-monochromatic non beam in general uh, a beam uh, that is ex having energies between a minimum and a maximum or a wavelength that is shown here as a, between a minimum and a maximum so if you imagine now that uh, you have uh, this uh, this beam and you make the equal, constru equal construction what we will have is two circles that are corresponding to the two different uh, wave vectors or wavelengths and as you realize here without needing of rotation you will have without needing to rotate the crystal you will have a number of diffracting planes in the lower condition those that are in the grain zone because the wavelength is varying continuously between these two circles and you can imagine to have difference of energy m much bigger and then with a single shot of x-rays and you this is generally done with x-rays with having that can be also neutrons uh, a span of wavelengths you will get immediately uh, a diffraction image in your detector and this is what is shown here so you have here pattern with obtained it with a lower method in a two-dimensional detector and you have just a very high number of spots and from this you can already get an idea on the uh, structure or, or the orientation of the crystals so sometimes it's used to orient the crystals and or by turning the crystal in different positions you can really reconstruct the full structure of your crystal but the most used method to characterize crystal is probably powder diffraction so powder diffraction in general with a monochromatic beam so here you have a, an image at the left of a crystal lattice in real space and at the right is Fourier transform that is the reciprocal lattice this is what you will get as image in the detector because remember that the detector is detecting giving you a projection of the reciprocal lattice in the diffraction experiment so now imagine that you put a number of crystals four crystallites which are all in different orientation so by turning the reciprocal lattice you will find the, the image at the right and if you increase the number of crystallites you start to see that what you are producing is a number of circles so in with by increasing the number of crisp of grains of number of grains you will finally end with a continuous lines around the origin and you see that the, and then you can add, integrate asymmetrically the intensity of the different spots and get an intensity as a function of ih or as a function of theta because we see that this co will correspond to a theta angle or two theta angle of diffraction and we see that uh, if we want to obtain information on the intensity of the of the um, of the x-ray spots we need to have a high statistics of grains on a high number of grains and this means this is the condition to have a good power what is called in x-ray diffraction having in diffraction having a good powder so here you have another view in which you can see the incident beam scattered by many crystallites in different directions and then given diffraction cones and these successive uh, diffraction cones uh, give rise to what is called in the detector the Debye-Schwerer rings and these each rings we see here that corresponds in fact to a two theta angle so to a different d spacing on the crystal this method is uh, very fast does not need any orientation of the of the powder it can just put a, or in front of the of the beam and we, we uh, have to count for some time to have enough photons 
and then we uh, it can be quite rapidly analyzed. So there are two types of Boulder diffraction. One is the one that uh, we have just described using a monochromatic beam. You have the sample, a two-dimensional two detector, and then you integrate. Uh, then you can refine the, the obtained uh, diffractogram, and one of the refinement methods is ritual refinement. Refinement means fitting the different structural parameters to obtain the to reproduce the experimental data. Another method to do powder diffraction is what's called the energy dispersive diffraction. Instead of exploring the reciprocal space by looking uh, at which are the diffracted angles by setting a monochromatic beam, we are going to look to which energies are uh, diffracted at a given direction, uh, and for this we'll need a, a white beam, a white beam of X-rays or neutrons. And this is shown at the right with an example of uh, evolution of, of uh, diffraction uh, pattern with uh, the application of pressure in, in, a, in a silicon clutterate. So this is a, just a, an imaginary view, but to, to, to recall that at the left here we have powder diffraction in which we have these debature rings and in a single crystal diffraction, we, ha we have spots. In here, you have a X ray powder diffraction pattern. And this is typically what you can see in many research paper. You will find the crosses that, which are the data, the lines that is the fitted, uh, the, the fitted model to this data using the ritual refinement that is a least squared refinement. Uh, the ticks that are in the down on the uh, spectrum are the position of these different diffraction peaks used for the refinement. And the line that is uh, uh, below is the difference between the model and the data, that is means the residual. So we are looking to reduce by refinement methods this residual to the minimum value. And the parameters that are uh, used to, um, to, to fit the data are, first of all, the geometrical parameters that are the cell parameters and the position of the atoms uh, in, in the basis. And then, of course, there are other parameters that we are not discussing now, but uh, dynamic parameters, movement of the atoms or the effects that will can appear, for instance. So here you note that the peaks decrease very rapidly in intensity with 2 theta, and this is due to the, to the K dependence of the X-ray atomic form factor that we will discuss. You can see here a neutron powder diffraction, a similar diagram. You can see in that case that we have different lines of ticks uh, below the spectrum, and this is because uh, the fitting is a multi-phased uh, fitting, so there are three different phases. And you also can uh, note that the intensity here is quite elevated to in the high angle region, and this is due to the independence with K of the Fermi length, which is the scattering or form factor for neutrons. So that was all for our third flip lecture.